Tony, I'm not quite sure whether it's an advantage or a, disadva a disadvantage being, um, give, having Tony as a warm-up man, because I'm not quite sure how I'm going to follow that. And there's already been a lot of mention of Time Team. And I'm sure most people here are fans of Time Team and got into archaeology maybe because of Time Team and Mick. So you might be asking, what the hell am I doing here? Because I'm probably one of the few... Yes, OK, thank you very much, John. <laughs> oh, God, the heckling started already. Um, it's quite daunting, actually, seeing so many people who are going to heckle me on the front row. Um, I was one of the few archaeologists in the country who wasn't on Time Team for, for various reasons. Um, but what I want to talk about um, very briefly is, as part of this celebration of mixed life, is the, are the years BTT, before Time Team, to find out what really made Mick tick, what started it all. And Tony's already alluded to elements of this, and some of those I'm going to re <coughs> repeat in, in the next half an hour. This is a lovely photograph of Mick that um, sits on the wall of our barn at a field school we run at Stourpain in Dorset, and which is called Mick's Barn. Um, because it's a place where we gather and where we do archaeology and we talk and we eat a lot of cake actually there as well, which I'm sure Mick would approve of. Um, part of Mick's legacy, you know, he has left an enormous legacy and I'm very pleased that I'm counted as one of, as one of Mick's friends. <coughs> Mick was very lucky, I think, in terms of how he started off, in his, because he had parents who were, who were interested, who were curious about the past. And I know that on their holidays, um, hang on a minute, right, I know on, on their holidays, oh, it does work, um, in Cornwall and other places, this was where Mick, I think, started to explore the landscape. I was very lucky to stay in the cottage that Mick and Theresa had bought in Cornwall not long before he, before he died. And being a nosy person, because archaeologists are supposed to be nosy, I couldn't resist having a look at some notebooks that sat in a bookcase downstairs. And I was absolutely staggered. Because what I saw in these notebooks, dating back to 1964, were some of Mick's earliest field observations. There were... <laughs> they were strange figures going across the... <laughs> Bugger off. Um, there, were, there were annotated maps, there were photographs, there were observations of the landscape, sketch plans, you know, noting how badly managed a site was, little curiosities, bits of information from Royal Commission volumes and from the Ordnance Survey. Um, Mix always seems quite scary in those days because he hadn't got a beard and I don't think anybody that knew Mick in later years can imagine him without a beard but here he is carrying out some of this early field work in Cornwall and I think this is something that, that really laid the foundations for his love of the landscape and his great observational skills and it's in the tradition of great archaeological field workers like Stukeley in the 18th century and some of our most recent landscape archaeologists like Hoskins one thing I've always found quite extraordinary, though, is that this is unbelievably organised. And everything else about Mick's life, well, most of it was fairly organised. I mean, his slide collection was, was unbelievable. And yet, apparently, when he was at university, he managed to get out of doing administrative work by claiming that he was too disorganised to actually be given the responsibility of doing admin, which I think is very cunning. So that was Mick's early years. These... <laughs> Not doing very well here. Um, this is the sort of <laughs> right. Okay. This this is the sort of this is the sort of thing. Plans of sites, sections through sites. The cairn was difficult to be found, and to a great extent has been destroyed, probably to build the sheep pen. It's that sort of detailed observation. Mick at school, I'm um, interested to know, and I'm not trying to draw too many parallels between Mick's life and mine, because, but there were certain things that went in tandem. Uh, Mick was obviously quite rebellious at school. I think he makes reference to his unkempt appearance and rebellious nature. Um, we both left school with headmaster's reports that effectively said they're not quite sure what this person is going to do with their life. Um, Mick, in contrast to me, though, was actually sensible and had worked and got some A-levels and was planning originally to go, uh, to go to teacher training college, which would have been an interesting sort of way of doing it. Um, but, in fact, he went to university in Birmingham uh, to study geography and archaeology. And Mick's 
thesis from Birmingham, his undergraduate dissertation, was just, again, astonishing, concentrating on Cornwall, detailed mapping, detailed observation. You know, I'm sure that it's one of those things that any, any tutor, when presented with an undergraduate dissertation like that, their heart would have sunk because basically they had this vast, highly illustrated tome to go through, full of observations, full of wonderful maps, just what you were talking about, that sort of observation of this is St. Ives. How has St. Ives grown from 1600 to the present day? Map 25. You know, it was just, you know, oh, you know. Um, but a brilliant piece of work. And, and already you can see Mick developing as this wonderful field archaeologist. What people don't know, I don't think, is there was actually also a very good illustrator a very good artist doing reconstructions of sites, Clun Castle by Mick Aston, as it may have appeared in 100 BC. So Mick already had this ability to take that hard evidence and to visualise it and to communicate it to other people in as many ways as possible. This is so, this is so important. Um, graduation, uh, Mick with uh, outer beard, another scary shot. Um, one of the things that Mick always says about Birmingham, though, is one of the key points is that he met Philip Ratz at Birmingham. Philip was teaching archaeology at Birmingham at the time. And at weekends would just stick notices up on the notice board saying, I'm going digging here, I'm going digging there. And Mick went off and dug with Philip on a whole number of sites around that area. That sort of, you know, you can see the Mick that was developing at this time. I love the fact that... In 1963, they'd called in, his family had called in at Stonehenge on the way home from holiday, and Mick had found this very impressive. His dad, by that time, had already read Atkinson's Stonehenge. And that Christmas, what Mick got as part of his Christmas present was the HMSO list of scheduled monuments in Britain and in England and Wales. Now, that's not a normal sort of Christmas present, is it, for a teenage boy? But, you know, all of this was going to make the Mick that, that we knew and loved. Philip Ratz here Mick with him as on Philip's 80th birthday was a huge influence because not only was he a great a digger, Although Mick didn't go down the digging route, but he also believed very firmly that people ought to teach. And so right from the beginning, right from a very early age, Mick was encouraged to teach extramural classes, um, starting off in the Birmingham area. And this is actually quite a, a scary thing to do. Um, because, you know, and, and he and I shared that, because I remember I, in Reading years later, um, decided that I'd teach a 20-week course on the introduction of archaeology when I'd never done any teaching before. Um, Mick did very much the same thing with the industrial archaeology course, terrifying, and you realise that you have to prepare an awful lot of stuff for an hour and a half session, so you end up with a lot of field trips. <laughs> While in Birmingham, um, this is an interesting, this is, this is Mick with James Bond. Now, if any of you know your archaeology, you'll know, you'll know James. Um, uh, a fellow landscape archaeologist and while in Birmingham, while Mick was undertaking his, his research there, they went out and devised methods of rapidly planning earthworks. He, he, Mick proudly says that he, he surveyed, he and James surveyed eight deserted medieval villages in a day once. And this is the sort of antiquarian barrow digging rate, isn't it? But, you know, these were just plans, they weren't doing any digging. I've always thought that James should have changed his name to something else because the inevitable reaction when somebody that looks, unfortunately, a bit like Rolf Harris comes up and says, <laughs> hello, my name's James Bond. You know, he used to get so pissed off with the sort of inevitable response. You know. But James, another, another amazing field worker. Um, after university, um, as, you know, as Mick puts it, when the grant ran out, um, he had to find a job. And he went off to Oxford where he worked and he site newly in sites and monuments record at Woodstock, where he met Don Benson and developed the sites and monuments record for Oxfordshire. Because at this time there weren't systematic records of counties. And actually inevitably this involves a huge amount of field work, going out, observing sites, recording them. Um, and so that was that was uh, Mick's sort of first career. I, a few years later, ended up uh, creating the Sites and Monuments record for Berkshire, very much modelled on, on the Oxfordshire model, on what they created there. Systematic maps, systematic records, a way of interrogating the past. Um, nowadays, they're not Sites and Monuments records, they're historic environment records. 
Um, but they're the same sort of thing, and they're a vital backbone to any sort of research that you're doing. You know, Stuart, if you go to an area, the first thing you do, you go to the HER, don't you? You look for all the information, what's known already, before you can start to build on it. And then you ignore it. <laughs> and then you ignore it, yeah. Actually, quite, yes, one thing you find when you're putting them together to start with is quite a lot of it is complete bollocks. But, um, so... Um, Basically, uh, after, after the time at, uh, at, at Oxford, um, you know, Mickey, he had a sort of restless soul. He, he fancied a change. Um, 1974, um, he went back to the southwest and became the first county archaeologist um, in Somerset. Um, and, you know, an area which he still associated, was still associated with and which, you know, he carried on doing field work in that area. But... I think it's interesting that by about, after about four years of that, there was a sense that this was too safe. This was too safe and pensionable. You know, it was a bit too cosy. And so Mick actually moved back to Oxford, very briefly as it turned out, to become... Oh, sorry, this is just a reminder. Um, the parallel, um, in 1970, I'd started digging. Um, this is what I looked like at the time. So... Um, <laughs> combat jacket, droopy moustache and I hate the world look. Um, <laughs> Mick moved up to Oxford to, uh, to become the ch a tutor in archaeology and became very deeply involved with the work that Trevor Rowley was doing in the extra meal department there. Um, but after a year of that, there, became, there was a job became available back in Bristol uh, at the extra meal department there as Peter Fowler moved on to become the head of the Royal Commission. So Mick moved back to Bristol. As somebody who was, uh, uh, at the time when I was at Reading, was doing field archaeology as part of my undergraduate dissertation, these two green books were my Bible. Landscape Archaeology, Aston and Rowley, published in 1974, and Chris Taylor's Fieldwork in Medieval Archaeology, another amazing landscape archaeologist, part of an incredible group of people who were really laying the foundations for the way we should study ancient landscapes. Is that a dog? <laughs> we'll come to dogs in a minute. Um, Bristol, I think this was what really sort of made me, because there was... <laughs> A um, huge amount of courses were set up and run. This is where Tony mentioned the fact that, you know, the, 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 the trips to Santorini with Peter Harding, wasn't it? The, the geologist who was doing the geological side of it. Um, Mick ran summer schools from there in Oxford um, at, uh, for Barclay. And uh, this rare photograph at the end here, this is the last recorded time that Mick ever wore a tie. <laughs> um, that's in 1989 when he had to wear a tie at these Oxford summer schools. But uh, that's the last record. But there's something about, you look at a lot of photographs from this time, something about Mick, he liked to be high up. He always liked to be perched up above people to sort of uh, impart his wisdom. That's one of the, that's one of the summer schools schools. Um, <laughs> this is sort of a, a health and safety nightmare. This is on, um, this is on, this is on Santorini, where, uh, you know, improvised stack of crates to get to a certain part of the, uh, the archaeological record. Um, you know, for somebody who subsequently broke their leg jumping over a wall, this is actually quite a dangerous thing to do. But, um, and also a time that Mick would uh, be prepared to be photographed wearing skimpy shorts and stripped to the waist. Um, this was the sort of era as well that I was prepared to be photographed wearing skimpy shorts and stripped to the waist. And this is the time that I first got to know Mick. 1980, I moved down to Wessex and started working for Wessex Archaeology, doing a project around Stonehenge. And because I'd been teaching from an early stage as well, because my first boss in Berkshire was Grenville Astell, who'd been a pupil of Philip Ratz's and who basically told me to start teaching as soon as I started work. I'd already done quite a lot of extramural classes. And when I went down to Salisbury, Bristol was my nearest extramural department, and I got in touch with Mick and started teaching lots and lots of evening classes. Um, prehistory of Wessex, how to do a parish survey, all of the sort of, you know, an introduction to archaeology, but not in 20 weeks, all the sort of things that, that were the staple of that very, very vibrant continuing education. Teaching in the department as well. One of the things that I realised that Mick was doing at this stage as well was he just started teaching courses for blind students. This started in 1981 
which was the year, International Year of the Disabled. And Mick had got together with a couple of people and almost accidentally had sort of decided to devise a course about teaching archaeology to blind and partially sighted adult students. And this, I think, follows this idea of making archaeology as accessible to as many people as possible. And they started off doing a series of chronological courses, you know, prehistory, the Romans, the Saxons, medieval period, monasteries. Um, and I got roped in at a fairly early stage to take groups to Stonehenge. And uh, this was, sorry, I was going to use the word eye-opener for me. That's the wrong word to use, isn't it, in this context? But it was, it was fascinating for me as somebody who was trying to develop my communication skills um, to work on courses like that. Because the field trips were fine. This was the days when English heritage allowed you to touch the stones. Um, I did actually suggest something about doing a course for archaeology for blind students a few years ago. and was told, yes, but you can't touch the stones. And I thought, what's the point of going into Stonehenge if we can't touch the stones? The classroom sessions were more interesting. When we were outdoors, we could create plans of sites using bits of balsa wood and, and braille tape. And then these would be turned into plastic thermoforms by prisoners at the local prison to Bristol. Um, they did a very good job on those. Um, the classroom sessions were, were interesting. Um, field work, I think, was the most fun side of it. Um, we developed ways of communicating the scale of monuments by pacing over things, by shouting across things. Um, I remember one completely disastrous day at Avebury, though, where it had been raining, and I said, OK, I'll go down the ditch, the bottom of the ditch, and I'll shout up, and then I'll go to the other side, and I'll shout up. And Mick said, no, we need to go down the ditch to get an idea of how big it is. I said, is this a good idea? Yeah, it'll be all right, it'll be all right. Um, two minutes later, there were... 12 guide dogs, 12 blind students, 12 sighted guides, all in a heap at the bottom of the ditch. <laughs> because it was, like, it was just like a ski slope. We'd all fallen down the ditch. Um, but, uh, you know, as Mick pointed out, it gave them a pretty good idea of how big, <laughs> how big the ditch was. Um, getting out was slightly more of a problem. But, you know, they, they were brilliant fun, these, these, these courses. I, I loved doing them, and they taught me so much as well. Um, now, classroom sessions. Interesting. When you're a lecturer, you rely on your visual images. You can't have any, can you? So, you are there in a classroom with a load of students who, to all intents and purposes, are asleep. You haven't got any images you can use. It's very disconcerting. But the worst part of it is the dogs. Because the dogs are asleep. And when dogs are asleep, they snore. <laughs> so you're sitting there in front of a group of people who sound as if they're asleep to the sound of gentle snoring. And that is really disconcerting for a lecturer. Um, you're not asleep, hopefully. Um, the worst one ever, though, was... When the guide dogs are let off the lead, they behave like normal dogs. They play, they fight, they run around. And there was one particular dog at Winterbourne Stoke Crosswords Barrow Cemetery that decided to eat a lot of sheep shit. Yeah, you know where this is going, don't you? So when we got back to the class, I'm there talking, and this dog walked out in the middle of the class. And you know when dogs do that thing where you know they're going to be sick? You know, they do that sort of... So it brought up all of this... Sheep poo, now that was disconcerting in itself, looked at it and then started eating it. <laughs> that, that's the only time that I've been completely flawed in a lecture, that I could not go on, you know. And, and of course, you know, the, the blind students don't know what's going on. They get the sound effects, but they, so they had to have it explained to them what was, what was going on. I've got to, I've got, there's one just small anecdote from those courses I've got to tell you. Normally, we had a brilliant coach driver from a coach company in Bristol, absolutely wonderful. We had a really grumpy one one day, a replacement one. He was a miserable, miserable man. He didn't want to drive us to places. He didn't want to go up lanes. He didn't like the fact that we were going into fields and we were getting a bit dirty. The guides had put a big water bottle um, on the parcel shelf, um, and it was leaking. We didn't realise this. And this bloke was quite a jerky driver. And he came up to roundabout, 
slammed his brakes on, and what we didn't realise was that the entire contents of this water bottle were in the luggage rack. As he braked, it went down the chute and went down the back of his neck, the whole lot. <laughs> about, you know, a gallon of water with a lot of old fag ends and dust and everything like that. Now, all the sighted people thought this was hysterically funny, of course, which didn't help. But then the students wanted to know what was going on, so we had to explain to them, which meant there was a second round of laughter. <laughs> that was not a good day. He was not a, he was not a happy man doing that. Um, but they were, they were absolutely brilliant. And we did a whole range of things. Another wonderful moment was when we were doing conflict and warfare, because we... I did a lot of thematic courses after Mick had got very involved in Time Team and didn't have the time to come and set the courses up. And we did ritual and religion, conflict and warfare. Um, as part of it, we got the Ermin Street Guard to come to Bristol. And the standard bearer walked into the hall where all the students were and promptly turned tail and ran out because the guide dogs had obviously thought... <laughs> He's wearing one of our relatives <laughs> and attacked him. This was absolutely brilliant to see the Ermine Street Guard standard bearer running like hell with four angry guide dogs chasing him. Um, you don't think of things like that, but, um, but you, you, you do. I wouldn't do it again. So we tried an awful lot of things. Um, the fine handling, you know, that's very tactile. You can get close to the objects, you can have to explain. Uh, Colin, who appears in both of these, um, will feature quite strongly because Colin was an absolute stalwart of the courses. Um, Colin's also the person to whom the term blind drunk um, would, <laughs> applies very well because Colin really liked his beer and had to be literally thrown out of the college bar every evening. Um, he had this very long-suffering guide dog that would just sit there all evening and then when it came to go would lead Colin, a weaving <laughs> Colin, off to his room. But he enjoyed life and he enjoyed these courses and he was there on everyone and learned a huge amount. Um, you know, Mick even managed, you know, as a vowed vegetarian, even managed to cope with the, the experimental butchery that we did. We did lots of experimental work. The Ancient Technology Centre at Cranbourne were fantastically helpful. You know, why can't you use a pole lathe if you can't see? Um, we did have some people fall off the replica of the sweet track at the Pete Moore's Visitor Centre because it's quite narrow and it's quite wobbly. And, um, but it's all part of the experience, isn't it? Um, Shapwick, which Chris is going to talk about a bit later, we went along there. We actually did earthwork surveying using braille annotated staffs. We had geophysical equipment that, was, that had an audible signal on it so that we could participate in all of these things. We went digging. Wessex Archaeology allowed us access to a dig. We talked about stratigraphy, the different textures of the layers, even the different sound of them as you trowel them. We got up and close with some of the ancestors. It was basically anything that we could try, we tried it. And we were so lucky because people were willing to come and get involved in this. Mick has a wonder, had a wonderful sort of um, address book. You could call on all sorts of people. And I think because it was Mick, people came and did it. We got Philip down to come and talk about Glastonbury Abbey. Not quite sure why he lay in a coffin at the time, but he obviously felt that it was part of the experience. Um, and the museums we worked with as well were brilliant. Steve Minnett at Taunton was wonderful. He'd get things out of the stores, but he'd also close galleries. He'd just simply put gallery closed, open the cases, and here we are. You've got access to all these wonderful organic remains from the Somerset levels, if we're talking about, we did a course about wood. So huge number of people participated in this. Um, absolutely brilliant. And a tragedy that the disabilities unit at the Bristol um, doesn't exist anymore. Um, a real shame, because I think they, they did a fantastic amount of work. Mick was also very passionate about working with youngsters. We're working with people, with school children, to get them excited. And I don't like reading quotes out that are on the screen, but it says, I've always felt most important role for us is to involve children and young people in archaeology. To misquote the Jesuits, get them at seven and you have them for life. Not only do most children enjoy archaeological sites, because it's experiential, isn't it? It's getting hands on, it's holding things, it's connecting with the past. Um, but if they're likely to carry on that interest through to adult life, whatever career employment they chose, as a result, they might hopefully remain sympathetic to the subject and particularly to money being spent on it, which is actually a very valid point. But this was just part, I mean, I, I think it's great that Tony's the president of the Young Archaeologists Club, encouraging people to get involved. 
the one thing that that Mick felt was was difficult, and I know it was difficult with Time Team because the way it was organised was that it's actually quite difficult for youngsters to get involved physically in the practicalities of archaeology. Um, and this is something, I think, because trying to build on all of those things I learnt through working with Mick that I've tried to do, getting kids involved in real archaeology, and actually that point that was made about making mistakes, about not getting things right, um, this is a site that we dug. I confidently told the pupils at this school that this was a medieval strip lynchet, not the Roman vineyard that had been told it was, and that we would find medieval pottery which would date this lynchet. Um, brilliant. I was wrong. Um, it was slightly deeper than we thought. And when at the... Uh, and, uh, and when at the bottom of this very deep lynchet section, we found late Bronze Age pottery and a beautiful Bronze Age, late Bronze Age disc-headed pin, um, I could announce that they'd discovered something completely different. And they couldn't understand why I was pleased to be wrong. But I said, well, that's the whole point of it. You know, I'm supposedly an expert, but I was wrong. You found the evidence that tells us that this field system is 2,000 years older than we thought it was. And that connection, when we found the pin, you know, I didn't grab it. I said, look, see that funny bit of green thing there? You pick that up. Why? Because you're the first person to hold that for 3,000 years. That's, these are powerful moments. They're powerful connections. And I love to see that excitement. Um, this was in a, uh, the garden of the vicarage at Durrington where we were trying to find evidence of the Saxon village and we kept finding Mesolithic flint. And the annoying thing was, we were doing a two by two metre test pit, uh, this little girl was next to me digging, she found all the flint, it was all in her square, I was finding nothing, she was going, is this another one, is this, a, is this another one, is this another one, yes, yes it is. Um, but that, that, brilliant, that brilliant moment, because what those objects do, they take you back into a different world. I could say to them, look, imagine a place that was densely wooded by the side of the valley, hunters, gatherers, there were wolves, there were bears, a different world. And that object has given you that connection with that different world. You know, this is, this is so important. It doesn't matter whether it's a Mesolithic flint or whether it's a nail from a First World War horse hospital building. The excitement is still there. It's that link with the past. And I think that's what... In a virtual way, you know, Time Team did so well. It gave you those clues. It showed how you could interpret them. It showed how you could bring the past to life, which is so important. Participation, bringing it to life. And of course, you know, you don't have to be young to get excited by finds, do you? <laughs> you know, I don't think the kids on this excavation could actually understand why I was so excited about this funny bit of stone, but it's part of a Neolithic polished axe. So as a prehistorian, I was excited by it. Um, and what I learnt from those formative years with Mick, I think hopefully has, has helped me to explain the past to as many people as possible. Um, it certainly helped me. I've done a lot of work with um, special schools, particularly one in, in Trowbridge, where we brought the past to life. And, you know, it's, it's all of those things that I learnt that meant I think they could come together and result in something like this. Uh, a beach market on Weymouth Beach, the culmination of an entire Viking week with the entire school made costumes, shields. We built a six metre long flat pack Viking boat, a tent. We went and had a beach market. We had Viking food. Vikings came from the sea and traded with us. You know, bringing the past to life. That's what Mick believed in and that's what I believe in very strongly. Um, I'm a Stonehenge obsessive, as you probably know, and uh, this is one way of, of bringing the past to life for kids. Um, one thing I have learnt from this, though, doing it many times, is that it's better just to use vegetables, because the kids eat the biscuits before you've actually finished Stonehenge, if you use uh, pink wafers and bourbon biscuits. Um, I hope that this has just given a very brief idea of where Mick came from, what, what made Mick tick. Um, he was, you know, a remarkable archaeologist, um, a wonderful character. I'm very privileged to have known Mick as a friend. And I have to say that, you know, at the beginning I said I'm one of the few archaeologists in the country who wasn't on time team. One huge regret from my point of view is that that would have given me more opportunity to, to work with him, to work alongside him. Um, but I had fantastic fun in those early years. 
There were times, I mean, Tony's already mentioned the fact that there were times around 2000 when both Meet the Ancestors and Time Team were on television at the same time. And people sometimes tried to sort of portray the programmes as rivals and Mick and I as rivals somehow. But, I mean, does this look like... Does this look like rivals? This was when we met up at Dillington, when we were both teaching courses there at the same time. So Mick, me, and one of our friends from Meet the Ancestors, we weren't, because I think to, to quote um, David Attenborough, um, who said, we're all labourers in the same vineyard, which I think is a lovely way of putting it. And I think we all share that passion for that for the past, the desire to bring it to life for people and to involve as many people as possible. And to both of us, I think, television was important, not for the sake of being on television. Neither of us, I don't think, started off with this idea of we want to be on telly. It was a way of communicating. And whether it was 30 people in a damp smelling village hall in the Somerset or in Wiltshire, which we've all done and continue to do, or 3 million people on television, it was the same thing. It was actually communicating and putting that message over. So I hope that that's given you a little bit of an insight into Mick's early life. Um, many of you may know that Mick wrote a book called Mick's Archaeology. I'm sure some of you have got a copy of this. It was something he described as being for the fans, um, written about halfway through Time Team's very long run. There are one or two second-hand copies that I've managed to obtain, because it's not, uh, it's not in print anymore, which are on sale here. And I'm afraid it's very much a case of first come, first served. The proceeds of that and the proceeds of any book sales of mine are going to Site Savers, which, is Mix, which was one of Mick's favourite charities. There are also, there's also going to be a copy of this which will be is signed by Mick, and I'm going to try and get all of the Time Team people to sign it, um, and then that's going to be go, that's going to go up on the Dig Ventures website as a sort of an eBay type auction. Um, so it'll be the ultimate signed mix archaeology, and the proceeds from that are going to go to Site Savers as well. So thank you for listening to me. I hope I haven't gone on for too long, and look forward to the rest of the weekend and meeting some of you at various other things that are going on. Thank you.